Uh, Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 to 21. Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus. This is John the Baptist, he told his servants. He's been raised from the dead, and that's why supernatural powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, chained him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, since John had been telling him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Though he wanted to kill him, he feared the crowd, since they regarded him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday celebration came, Herodias' daughter danced before them and pleased Herod. So he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. And prompted by her mother, she answered, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. Although the king regretted it, he commanded that it be granted because of his oaths and his guests. So he sent orders and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. Then his disciples came, removed the corpse, buried it and went and reported to Jesus. When Jesus heard about it, he withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. As he stepped ashore, he saw a huge crowd, felt compassion for them and healed their sick. When evening came, the disciples approached him and said, this place is a wilderness, it's already late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. No, they don't need to go away, Jesus told them. You give them something to eat. But we only have five loaves and two fish here, they said to him. Bring them here to me, he said. Then he commanded the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Everyone ate and was filled Then they picked up 12 baskets full of leftover pieces. Now those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Ben brought a very important fact to my attention as we were standing together photocopying uh, before the service. That's when a lot of important facts come out. Uh, Whose anniversary of rule is it at the moment? The Queen's. How many years has she been Queen? 70 years. That's remarkable. And uh, Ben heard a very interesting point about her this morning. Someone said the secret to her rule and its success was that she always put other people first. Uh, Is that going to be the case in our federal election year this year, do you reckon? It is a federal election year, isn't it? Uh, If you've noticed, Scott Morrison has been out meeting tradies and washing hair. Anthony Albanese is finally telling us what he's on about. The jostling has started, hasn't it? It's going to be a long campaign, isn't it? Uh, They always seem to get longer and longer. Stump speeches are happening. There's propositions being put. Sometimes a policy is leaked and the editorials are happening and they reveal more about the reporters than the politicians, don't they? The more and more we have elections in this nation, the more and more they're reduced to a competition between two people, aren't they? the more and more they're about which leader. Remember our last federal election campaign? It got to the point where the party labels were removed from the core flute. So it came down to this, Scott, Bill. It's really a summary of what we had, isn't it? In essence, which leader do you want? That's the question we're asked today, isn't it, as we return to Matthew's biography of Jesus. Uh, Let me tell you, it's not a political question. It's not a how to lead seminar. It's not even a comment on our secular leaders. It's just a contrast between two kings. Which leader do you want? Or perhaps more importantly, which leader do you need? Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thank you uh, that it is a revelation of reality, who you really are who we really are, and what your real solution is. 
Father, thank you that today we, re- we meet two real kings. Uh, there is a real contrast between them. Uh, there is a real difference. And Father, as our need is revealed, please work in us so that we can see which king we need and so which king we need to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, there are four good news biographies of Jesus in the Bible. Uh, my mother often accuses me of using too many words, and I have used it then, but I think it's helpful to describe them as good news biographies. They're biographies of Jesus. They're accounts of his life, but they have a very distinctive aim. They want to tell good news, not just to the readers, but good news for the whole world. And those four biographies each have a particular focus. They present the good news of Jesus in a particular way for a particular reason. Are they no different to any other good piece of history which is written from a perspective? All good history works that way. And so if you've got your Bibles open there, turn with me to the first verse of Matthew's good news biography. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. The historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's telling you everything you need to know about this book. It's a book of new beginnings. That's literally what the historical record means. It's about a man called Jesus Christ, and he's connected to two great figures in history. He's connected to King David, the ideal king of God's people, and a bloke called Abraham, through whom God said he would heal a broken world. And in case you doubt that, you then get his genealogy, don't you, in the next few verses, verses 2 to 18. Remember we looked at that back at the start of 2019? And when you look through that, you'll notice two things again. It all revolves around those two men, David and Abraham. But secondly, amongst that list of men are a number of women, aren't there? And remember back when we looked at it, we described them as women of ill repute. If you're going to create an ideal family tree for the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, you'd whitewash these people. But they are there, aren't they? They are there. Because when you put all of those words together, Matthew's good news biography of Jesus is this. God provides new beginnings through his promised King Jesus who will bring the outsiders in. God provides new beginnings through his promised King Jesus who will bring the outsiders in. And Matthew's a living example of that, isn't he? If you remember when we looked at Matthew a couple of years ago, he's an outsider who's been brought in. He's one of God's people. He's a Jew, but he's a tax collector. Uh, Not only is he a tax collector, but he's a tax collector for the occupying power, the Romans. He's working for the enemy. He's a collaborator. You don't want him around for dinner. As a Jew, though, he's also on the outer of the Roman society, so he's caught in between, isn't he? He's an outsider to the Jews. He's an outsider to the Romans. And as we heard when we looked at him, he's an outsider to God. He's an enemy to the Jews. He's an enemy to the Romans. He's an enemy of God. And Jesus meets him and Jesus says, hey, Matthew, come and follow me. And when Matthew followed that King Jesus, all of those long-held promises of God about fixing up the broken were confirmed. And Matthew was transformed, completely changed. Not everyone's received Jesus like that, have they? Certainly not in this good news biography. Not everyone's treated him as good news. The religious authorities of the time hate him. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14, we're told that their aim was to destroy him, literally wipe him from the pages of history by hook or by crook. Those who were his own family in Matthew 12 scratch their heads and go, he's bonkers. And when he goes back to his own town in Matthew 13, they say, what a hide. We know this boy. He played with our boys. He was a tradie in this town. He grew up to be a carpenter. What makes him think he's the son of God? And they reject him too. 
Uh, the crowds followed Jesus, they didn't they? He healed them. He spoke to them. He was open with them. He was transparent with anyone who met him. I've come to deal with the outsiders, humans on the outside. In the biggest sense, an outsider is someone who's not just an enemy of the Jews or the Romans, it's someone who's an enemy of God. So Jesus has come to deal with every human being because we are all sinners, people who say, I'm God and God's not. And so Matthew has put this biography together, this good news biography together for every human being to read so that the outsiders can have a new beginning. It didn't work too well in his own town. I'm at point three on the outline. Let me remind you of where we left off from Matthew last year, Matthew chapter 13, verses 57 to 58. And they, his own town, were offended by him. Jesus said to them, A prophet's not without honour except in his hometown, in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Rejected in his own town, reports are going around about Jesus and reports reach the ears of those in authority. Verse 1 of chapter 14, at that time Herod the Tetrarch, Herod the ruler of a quarter, heard the report about Jesus. Herod comes to a conclusion, doesn't he? And so opens up a really striking account of two kings, two meals, two crowds, two outcomes. Now there is a lot more going on here. There are several different sermons, and I'm only going to preach one this morning when we look at a passage like this. As you unpack these two meals, you've got to be struck. Look at John's death. It's pretty similar to what happens to Jesus, isn't it? An unfair death of an innocent man. When you look at what's going on here, you should be struck by the links with all of those Old Testament feeding miracles. You know the one we read about Elisha? And 20 loaves for a 100 people, what does Jesus do? But today I just want to focus on the two kings and the comparison between them. At point four on the outline, King Herod uh, thinks Jesus is John the Baptist raised from the dead. Uh, Because he's been raised from the dead, he's got supernatural powers. And so Matthew takes the opportunity to unpack what Herod is like and it revolves around two meals and two crowds. John's not a quiet man. He's a relative of Jesus and he calls a spade a spade. Herod's been caught in adultery and corruption and John has confronted him and said, hey, king, that's not right. It lands him in jail, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Herod's fascinated by a guy who's willing to stand up to power. Herodias hates him and she starts plotting. And as Matthew starts to unpack these relationships, we learn something very important about Herod in verse 5 of Matthew 14. Though he wanted to kill him, he feared the crowd since they regarded him as a prophet. Herod fears the crowd. He's a man driven by self-interest. He's a man driven by fear. He's a man driven by the poles. He's a man driven by self-protection. Isn't it always the case that you know true leadership when it has to stand up in front of a crowd? When it has to operate in the court of public opinion? And we see it displayed in his birthday celebrations. It's a corrupt event, isn't it? It's vile. It's dirty. If we're going to use common parlance from today, it's the epitome of the swamp, isn't it? Herod invites the high and the mighty. Herod indulges in all forms of gluttony and drunkenness. I'm so thankful Matthew doesn't give us a warts and all description because even the notion that he's entertained by that kind of dance... And all of it leads to a dirty deed, doesn't it? Look at verse 7. So he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. And prompted by her mother, she answered, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. Although the king regretted it, he commanded that it be granted because of his oaths and his guests. 
So he sent orders and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. Did you see who Herod was scared of? The crowd again, wasn't it? The guests, the people at the tables. The result is tragic, isn't it? Can you imagine the waiters coming out? Here's a stuffed pig. Here's some quail. Here's a peacock. Here's a head. That's the image you're meant to get, isn't it? All these silver platters coming out. And what's on one of them? The head of a godly man. Chopped off because Herod feared the crowd. What a king. What a king. The man who fears the crowd, who brings death. The report gets back to Jesus, doesn't it? I will turn to him in a moment, but I want you to just notice these things. Did you notice the meal? It's the insiders, isn't it? It's the insiders who get invited. Did you notice the crowd? It's the insiders, isn't it? Did you notice the king? A man driven by self-interest, fear of the poles, driven by the crowd, beholden to his lust for power and his self-image. Did you notice the outcome? What does that all bring? It brings evil, corruption and death. Well, the account of Herod started with a report, didn't it? And that's the same with Jesus. It starts with a report. I'm at point five on the outline, verse 13. When Jesus heard about it, he withdrew from there by a boat to a remote place to be alone. And when the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. Jesus knows the fate that's awaiting him. We'll find out about more of that in chapter 16 in the last sermon in this series. He knows the timing, so he withdraws. He wants to be alone. He knows he's operating in Herod's territory, and so he withdraws. The crowds have tracked his steps. He goes on a boat, point A to point B. They run around the lake and they reach the destination before him, don't they? Did you notice that? When he gets to the shore, they're already there. They are so desperate. As he stepped ashore, he saw a huge crowd, felt compassion for them and healed their sick. What a contrast to Herod. What a contrast Herod fears the crowds. Jesus has compassion on the crowds. A compassion is such a vanilla word in our vocabulary, isn't it? It kind of raises image of kind of pastel John Sands greeting cards. It's not like that in the Greek. Uh, literally in the Greek is his guts were so churned on behalf of them. He had earthquakes in his guts. Not butterflies, not steadiness, but his insides were churned up as he stepped ashore and looked at this crowd. In fact, in the whole New Testament, Jesus is the only man described in this way. It's the only time this word is ever applied to a human being in the New Testament. And it's not the only time, is it? Remember back in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus went to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. It's not because their clothes are dirty. It's not because they haven't had a shower or they're hungry. It's because they're humans. He has compassion because of their nature. They're lost. They're weary. They're worn out. And they have no one to shepherd them. What do they need? They need three square meals? No. They need a new set of clothes? No. Do they need a shower and a haircut? No, they need a shepherd, don't they? They need a saviour. They need a Lord because their way of life is not working. Sin has not produced what it promised. Being God instead of God is not all it's cracked up to be. Do you ever identify with that? Do you ever feel weary and worn out, desperate for rest? 
Do you ever feel like it would be terrific to have a shepherd? Do you ever feel so broken that it's a struggle to get out of bed? Do you ever feel so burdened by trying to be God that you're worn out? Uh, let me tell you, I do. <laughs> My sinful way just does not bring me the rest I need. My attempts to be God do not bring creation, they bring destruction. My attempt to run my universe never brings wholeness or fullness. It just brings tiredness and brokenness and anxiety and disappointment. Do you ever feel like that? God promised that he would send a shepherd. God promised that he would send someone just like David, only greater. God promised that he would send someone who would grab the broken and bind them up, that he would meet the damaged and heal them. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 12. As a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock, so I will look for my flock. I will rescue them from the places where they've been scattered on a cloud, cloudy and dark day. Verse 16, I will seek the lost. I'll bring back the strays, I'll bandage the injured, I'll strengthen the weak, but I'll destroy the fat and the strong. I'll shepherd them with justice. I will appoint over them a single shepherd, my servant David, and he will shepherd them. He will tend them himself and will be their shepherd. And look, there he is on the edge of the lake, isn't he? He's just stepped out of a boat. He wants some downtime, some me time. He's got the boundaries up. There are no boundaries here, are there? Do you notice what he does when he sees the crowd? He rolls up his sleeves. He has compassion on them because his guts are churning and he heals them. Don't limit it to that. There is something bigger going on here. He's not about a political revolution. He's not about making sure that cripples can just walk. He's about dealing with the sick, the weary, and the broken by dealing with their sin. And this is a picture of that compassion. Well, the day comes to a close. Everyone's exhausted. The crowd's been there all day. The disciples, aren't they great? They always think about the logical stuff. Verse 15, Matthew 14, when evening came, the disciples approached Jesus and said, this place is a wilderness. Uh, it's already late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. They don't need to go away, Jesus told them. You give them something to eat. Well, we've only got five loaves and two fish, they said to him. Bring them here to me. Jesus invites the disciples in to do the work with him, doesn't he? Come and join me in this job, this compassion. They're overwhelmed. Jesus steps in. Do you see it there in verse 19? commanded the crowds to sit on the grass, took the five loaves, two fish, looking to heaven, blessed them. He broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the crowd. Everyone ate and was filled, 12 baskets full of leftover pieces. Few resources, compassionate king. Sit down, give me the food. Father, thank you for this. Hand it out. Everyone's fit. All are satisfied. The numbers are amazing. What a contrast. Did you notice the meal? It's like a family meal, isn't it? <laughs> Head of the household there, sit down, let's say grace. Did you notice the crowd? No insiders. This isn't the swamp. This is the grass on the hill. All outsiders, desperately in the, the king. A man of immense, overflowing, gut-churning kindness who gives of himself even as he wants to be left alone. The outcome, feeding, life, abundance for everyone in need. Two leaders, two meals, two crowds, two reactions, two outcomes. One question. Which leader? 
which leader? Now, let me tell you how not to apply this very briefly. This isn't a how-to-vote card for the coming federal election campaign. Uh, This is not even a comment on secular leaders. Even though compassion is a good thing in our political leaders, there are much higher stakes here, aren't there? One is murderous, the other is life-giving. One fears the crowd, the other has his guts churned by the crowd. One deals with the outsiders, one serves the outsiders. One gives a meal of corruption and evil and dirty deeds. The other lifts his eyes to heaven and shares scant resources in abundance. Which leader is the one our world needs? Which leader do you need? Which leader would you follow? Which leader do we offer the world? Our world is crying out for a leader of gut-turning, gut-wrenching kindness who reaches to the outsider, who provides abundantly for life, who brings the outsider inside by dealing with their sin. Our world is crying out for Jesus, isn't it? Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. I read this morning that to open your word is to grab a tiger by the tail. I was reminded this morning that your word is not full of platitudes but full of realities. Father, you have confronted us with the reality of our need this morning. In our weariness, give us rest with the King who is compassionate and help us to offer him and him alone to this world that is so tired and broken. Amen.